purpose of this workshop, um, negotiating order with gender pattern language, uh, is to um, discuss with you different approaches uh, associated actually with uh, the nature of order and thinking about the nature of order in a larger sense. Uh, and there's a lot of a lot of terms within Christopher Alexander's literature um, that describe this. Um, and so I'm trying to make more sense out of it. And uh, this is some preliminary work on that. This, uh, Chris was at the other talk uh, that I gave a purple talk, which was related more to history of science. This one is actually trying to apply something a little bit different. Um, so I'm David Ng. Uh, I'm finished my PhD at Buffalo University, still working on that. Uh, and I was uh, former president for the International Society of System Sciences. Uh, the history I have with pattern language actually goes back into the 1960s. Um, I spent 28 years working with IBM, so I was one removed from John LaCity, who was one of the gang of four, and there's other people working on pattern language inside of IBM. And for those of you who don't know, probably like most people don't, wouldn't know, um, the IBM Global Services Method in the mid-90s was actually developed based off pattern language. It doesn't exist anymore because when IBM uh, purchased PricewaterhouseCoopers, the PricewaterhouseCoopers people thought they to teach us how to do consulting work and then wipe it on pattern languages. Um, but uh, I've been working on pattern languages for quite a long time. So this workshop is um, going to run through some ideas with you and uh, we'll see how they resonate with you. Uh, you should feel free to comment, uh, yell, say this is good, this is bad, and uh, we'll see where we go on here. So there's some key words in here. Um, order, uh, when you look to Christopher Alexander's um, work, nature of order actually comes out fairly late. Uh, it comes out around uh, 2004, 2005 with the publishing of Nature of Order. Before that, it had a lot of, a lot of language like um, uh, time, uh, like quality without a name. And so the question that essentially is asked and, and criticism that Alexander had um, in the 1996 Uppsala meeting, uh, the criticism of people working in computer science was, okay, yes, using pattern language, but you're not making things, you're not, you're not solving issues in the bigger sense of what's happening here. You can use pattern language in a narrow sense describe what you're doing inside the code, but what he was thinking of was something larger, and in effect, that was generative. And so what do we mean by generative? Um, it's supposed to generate wholeness, generate beauty, generate quality without a name, and there you kind of get this issue going on about language and what it is you're trying to do. Um, the idea of negotiating order is something that I've written a research paper with uh, around 2005, I guess, and so I'll introduce you to some of those ideas. Okay, so um, what we'll try to do is, is talk a little bit through uh, what ordering means, and uh, there's some work on deliberate versus emergent. Uh, then we'll talk about creating order of versus creating order, negotiating order with, and then I'm going to go through some theoretical stuff. Depending on the interest, I can go faster or slower through that material. Um, because it's how you build, build these up into a, uh, a frame of reference, which is like a paradigm. Uh, what I'm going to propose is that we actually be looking at the frame of reference as a dual, because it's not just one is right and the other one is wrong. It's that you end up having to deal with both when you're actually working on uh, putting order together with something. And then, well, have some collaboration on practice, and I have two hours, so we should actually get through it today. So, have anyone seen this one before from Henry Mintzberg? Strategies of pattern, specifically a pattern in the stream of actions. This is from the management literature. Okay, it's actually quite old. But if you if you have taken organization theory, organization behavior, organization design course, then in effect you should have um, encountered this diagram. Now, in business strategy, uh, there's actually seven schools of strategy of which strategy of a pattern is one. And the reason this one's valuable is that you have the idea of intended strategy, what you want to do in this particular business or company or whatever organization you have, and from that you end up with a deliberate strategy, which you actually want to, which, which is what you actually do. Because there could be a difference between what you're deliberating on and what your intended strategy were, was, 
all the other parts that are, don't make it from the intended strategy dropped off as unrealized. Okay? But while that drops off, you have all these emergent strategies that happen during, um, during the work. Um, and that's what ends up in, in real life strategy. So if we're talking about software development and we're talking about agile, um, agile is actually a method that kind of deals with this some more. Because what happens is you start a project up and you say, this is what the project's about. Here's the scope. Uh, you know, how long do it take? Well, I don't really know. You know. What do the users want? Well, I don't really know. Okay, well, we'll build some stuff. Uh, we'll start off with initial intention and we'll start working on stuff. And then things, some things fall off as uh, unrealized. But then you always get this emergent stuff happening, which is, oh, I thought it was going to be building A. No, we're building B. Oh, okay, well, you know, that's not what you told us. Yeah, but that's what I want. <laughs> so, so this is a typical problem that happens. Um, so the, the, this idea um, is, is involved in Chris Crowley and his work in an uh, implicit way when we start dealing with biological systems and evolution. Because we think about evolution, um, and, we, and we appreciate evolution, but there are these things that happen as you evolve along, that the intended result um, may not, the intended direction may not be realized in the end. So if we were actually looking at pattern language to be complete, in effect, we should also be taking in the possibility for the emergent along the way. Comments, questions? When you say, if you look at it from a pattern language perspective, you need to take into account the emergent things that get into the way. But don't you use the patterns as part of the intentions and, re and realization and emergent things? So I, I, I have difficulties to formulate this question because it's emerging in a fuzzy yeah, way. Yeah, that's fine. That's good. <laughs> yeah, my no, mind. No, that's, that's, that's why there's a workshop. Do, do you understand what I'm Yeah. Thinking? So, so <laughs> if, if there is this implicit belief that you should have a complete pa pattern language, you will never have a complete pattern language, right? Uh, so if, if we go back to Christopher Alexander's work, um, one of the things, um, and I, I think I'll get, to, I'll get to this at the end, uh, in the um, Aishin school, and so this is the, uh, the Battle for Life and Beauty on the Earth, which is the 2012 book, um, there is a section of patterns of the buildings and patterns of the land. Okay? The patterns on the land are actually pretty fixed. Um, you could kind of bulldoze and move things around, but he's got a pond in the middle of the, uh, the trough, in the middle of the property, and so you can, you can put some of those things in as intended, but what happens is you also have all these emergent things that happen um, when you start building and then you see that things are not going as well as they're supposed to. Um, in particular, we try to put the buildings on top of the land, they don't quite fit, right? So where does it come from that you actually decided that, that and this is actually fairly late in the project, He's got all the patterns, he understands all the patterns, but then assembling the patterns together, it doesn't quite all hang together. Um, the reason that Alexander wants, doesn't want blueprints, he wants the construction on the land, is because when you're on the land, then you can see that fine detail happening, like, oh, I need to move this, like, just this much, and then everything will be fine and line up really well. Um, in agile development, the same sort of things happen, which is, you're, de you're developing software, you are delivering things, and then when you deliver even just a rough, a rough sketch to someone, and they look at it and go, that's what I asked you for, but that's not what I want. You're starting to get the emergent coming in. Okay? This is, the, this is actually probably the easiest slide on the, uh, in the whole, so let's see how this all fits together with other things. <laughs> It's, well, it, it's an idea, you see, that, uh, they, uh, because, I come, because I come from a systems theory background, the idea of emergence is, is kind of implicit. So if you're talking about biology, like my children don't look like me or my wife. Like, you know, some look more like me, some look more like my wife, and then you kind of go, I don't know where they got that from. 
you know, it's, it must be from my grandfather or something like that. So you have these emergent properties that happen. Um, you, you can explain some of them, you can't explain all of them. Okay, creating order of and negotiating order from. These slides are all available on my website. For those of you who um, would like, I have a uh, happy log. I have bookmarks. Uh, somewhere on the bookmark is the uh, coavolving.com, which is my website. And so this content is all on there. You can follow along. And there's quite a lot of text on here if you want to follow along. Okay. So creating order of originates with phys physical geometric structure. And if we go back to Alexander, and this is 2002, he wrote this. Um, there's a little kind of preamble here where it goes through physics and biology and stuff like that. But I argue the process of building is an order creating process of no less importance than that physics and biology. Okay? So this is, um, this is in, I believe, a paper that is uh, the scientific explanations um, for, for uh, nature of order. And this is, uh, the references are all in the paper that's associated with this one. Um, when we start working through some more of the text, um, you'll find out that he says that um, he was influenced by David Bohm. Uh, how many of you know David Bohm? Okay, no, one. Um, so David Bohm was a, a physicist uh, who, who was working in philosophy. Um, some people would say that he's one of these people that works on trying to explain the theory of everything. Uh, but he had some ideas about the, about the way that uh, order is reached. And so David Bohm tried to outline a possible theory in which order types of many levels exist and are built in hierarchies of progressive, more complex order types. But none of this is suggestive of all directly useful to a builder. So Alexander liked the work of David Bohm. David Bohm has been locked in the knowledge management literature, um, but wasn't using it in architecture or using it in built environments. So in 1999, um, this is the, uh, the work that was done this was the 1996 OOPSLA paper, OOPSLA conference that was rewritten as a paper. And he says, we're looking for the extent to which, as a whole, a pattern language would produce a coherent entity. Have you done that software pattern theory? So this is where the criticism comes in, is that he's looking for something that's not in, and that's, uh, not in a single pattern, but in a combination of patterns. Um, so what, one of the things that always strikes me uh, badly, and this is because of the way I use the language, I tend to use the term pattern language, I tend to not use the word pattern. Uh, because to me, a single pattern by itself is like saying it's a part. So talking about a tire, when you're looking, at, when you're look, really looking for automobile transportation, um, and you're looking for a whole car, I'm interested in the tire in relation to the car, um, not just the tire by itself. So in this sense, we're not just at the pattern level, we're at the pattern language level, and you're looking to produce a coherent entity. Now all this, I believe, is creating order of, uh, because Alexander had some, done some previous work, um, I'll show you on another slide, um, where he had created his idea of systems generating systems. And the idea was that the pattern language would generate a built environment. Yes. I have difficulties to, to grasp what is really meant in some of the literature that I read, whether the generativity is about the pattern language that generates a building, or if the pattern language generates a building that generates something else. Okay. And to me, the generative that Alexander was talking about was the that the thing he creates generates something else which is alive, etc. Okay. But, but sometimes I feel that in the discourse it's dragged back to it all actually is related to the patterns and the pattern language themselves that needs to be alive and gen generated. Yes. But do we forget the generativity of what is built? And when I, from your blog and, and, and analysis of the Uxla uh, video and conversation, I understood that he was actually himself, Alexander, talking about what the software and what the code that was applied to the software could generate as good in the world. So from the design to 
something else in the world. So. Okay. So, so for the rest of you, if, you, if we start getting too deep, Colleen and I are actually both in the systems community. So <laughs> we have these kind of conversations offline. And I think it's a good place to have them because you, you don't get the opportunity to discuss this very often, right? So. So we're, we're now between things that we're finding unclear. So I, I think this is where we start having to be self-critical about what we're doing. Uh, because there is Christopher Alexander, and Christopher Alexander and what he does and his understanding of systems theory. And then there are other people who are working with what they think Christopher Alexander is trying to do, which may or may not be consistent with what is happening here. So let, let me draw the parallel um, to um, Umberto Maturana, this, and, and this is getting into systems theory, who has this idea, if some of you may have heard the term, autopoiesis. Autopoiesis is the ability of a system to create itself. So biology is based off the principle of autopoiesis. What happened was that the knowledge management people came along and said, oh, then we can use autopoiesis in terms of knowledge. And it's very, very common for people to use autopoiesis in terms of knowledge. But when you go back to Maturana, Maturana says, this has nothing to do with knowledge management. So you people are using the term autopoiesis, but it doesn't mean what you think it means. It's supposed to be self-generating. So can you have knowledge create more generate more knowledge? He's worked out a little biology. I'm talking about biology creating more biology, right? So Christopher Alexander, in my reading, and I'm willing to be corrected on this, he is concerned about generating the building, okay? Um, and there's a, um, there is a architectural theorist, I think Schumacher, uh, who has written uh, autopoetic theory on, um, on architecture, and he makes a distinction between autopoiesis and allopoiesis. Autopoiesis is like an organism that self-recreates, Allopoiesis, he describes as a factory line. So you have a car, you know, you, have, you assemble a car, you put the tires on, you put the chassis on, you put the engine in, you put all this stuff, and it comes off the end of the line, and when the car is finished at the end of the line, that's it. That car is not producing another car. So that is allopoetic. Now, if, if you look at Alexander's work, I don't see any mention of allopoetic. I don't know if he actually discusses it. He did, you know, so, so we're now getting trying to infer what he was thinking about. Um, similarly, we, we have the idea of unfolding, unfolding wholeness in, in Christopher Alexander's work. But if you are working in biology, it's not like a physical thing where you put pieces together. And so my question is, how do you do enfolding? So if you're going to, if, if you think about, uh, so unfolding over time is like a flower. So the idea would be that you design a flower, it eventually blooms and flourishes and these sorts of things, like you start in the seed, right? Uh, oh, but the unfolding is also that uh, in, each, and, and in each step that you go forward, yes. you take into account the current context. So okay. then, then it's the, uh, how Alexander said, the unfolding means, okay, uh, I don't have written down the complete plan, I say, okay, this is the next step, let's see how where we are then, then we do the next one, that's the unfolding, I think, uh, and it's, Pretty much like in a uh, genetical talk where, where, where the uh, cells are evaluating the context again and again. Right. Uh, well, well, yeah, there, there's a really interesting fine point because um, what happens when you, if you keep evolving, you make decisions that cut off future branches, right? So the things you can't do with your standing at this point in time. So you're saying, I can go here, but I can't go there. So in order for you to have gotten to this point in time, you have to have already enfolded stuff that allows you to continue to move that direction forward. So the, so the unfolding happens, but it, it, this is why I started with the first slide, because there's emergent stuff that happens. So there, there's things that you intend. So you program in um, an ability to self-generate, uh, okay, uh, ability to recreate my finger. So my finger gets cut off. I want to build in the, you know, I'd be like a new to make it create that in, right? So it would unfold that eventually over time my finger gets cut off, it unfolds, but there have to be the programming in that says that if my finger gets cut off, I can actually have the ability to reproduce that part. So there, there, there's an issue in biology about whether uh, things are 
um, are built into the system. So the difference between uh, being born at a high altitude and being raised from a child at a high altitude, as opposed to you being born at sea level and then you go to a high altitude and now you have to adjust when you're an adult. It's a lot more difficult. So there, there's an unfolding and infolding that happens with that. Now, I'm trying to get back to Helene's original question. Sorry, I'm digging down here. Uh, because, again, this is parts where, because Christopher Alexander doesn't do many citations, it's really hard to figure out had he thought about this or did he have a different interpretation, right? So, so my interpretation of his interpretation of what I've seen written, and again, I, you know, I welcome being corrected on this, is that I think all the stuff I've seen, and there's an article actually called Generative Codes, and the generative codes is to create a building or a neighborhood, but after that, the building doesn't self-generate. That's not what he's designed to do. So th this, is, this is why I've been going and meeting people like, like Max uh, Jacobson, because I can ask him, and even he gets to the level, I don't know, and I ask, you know, Adjo, and it's like, oh, I don't know. We get to this point where you, you can only infer so much. And so there's a certain amount of theoretical work, I think, within the pattern language community. If we are going to move forward, we have to tackle some of the stuff. Chris Brown Alexander is not going to do the work. So we can decide either way. And, and the purpose of having the workshop is to surface some of these things so you have your own position. Because I have a position, but the desire I have within the workshop and within the community is just know where you are and you know, and, and decide this is the direction you want to go, and that's okay. But if you come in and you say, I'm following Christopher Alexander, I would go, do you mean Christopher Alexander in 1999 or 2000? Because he keeps changing his language. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so creating order of. Now I'm gonna suggest an alternative. Um, and um, in our discussion group earlier, we actually had the mention of Anselm Strauss. You mentioned Anselm Strauss. And so Anselm Strauss had the idea of negotiated order, which was a social order with negotiated order. And um, the idea was that uh, the original history of this was uh, negotiated order was formed in uh, at a time in the 1960s when they're, invest they're looking at sociology around work in emergency rooms and hospitals. Uh, and so at that time, uh, work rules weren't very tight and so you would have people, uh, you would have um, people coming in the emergency room, um, the doctors would be mopping floors because they got really messy, the nurses would be doing things they're not supposed to do, but things need to work out in the emergency room. And then they went to, uh, the, the regulators came in and said, no, doctors do this, orderlies do this, nurses do that, and they discovered that people were dying because the job descriptions were too narrow. So Anselm Strauss wrote this idea, wrote this uh, book, actually, that includes the idea of social, of negotiated order. And when you say the term negotiated order, negotiated order doesn't necessarily mean negotiating with a person, although it can. It can also mean negotiating with an environment in the way that you drive a, uh, drive a car around a mountain curve. So you negotiate when you're driving that way. So you may negotiate with an individual, but you may negotiate with a non-physical environment as well. Is, question, um, question, yes, yes, yes. is this close to organized complexity? No, this is way well, this is the 1960s, so we're nowhere near there. Okay. So yeah. That I, I it could, but then you but Strauss didn't write it, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but the notions are they no, no, because, of, because of, uh, the complex adaptive system doesn't come until after 2000. So, yeah, it's, it's much, much later. So, um, now, um, one of the issues is that as we're working more in social senses, and this is why it's interesting working in, at Purple Sock. So, Purple Sock is a pursuit of pattern languages for social change. And so, it's clear they are working in the social domain. Now the question we have when we're working in information systems, because Hillside Group has the, has the heritage that way, is about what is the system boundary? Are you, is your system boundary just the software, or does your system boundary include the people and the software? And that was a criticism that Alexander had in 1999, in, from the 1996 conference. Um, and, and if you start getting over to the social, then it's not just creating order of a kit of parts, you're now negotiating order in a social sense. 
figure that if you think about software development, the two two groups of people involved, one is the end user of the software, mm -hmm. and the other is the uh, the programmer. Sure. So I think the, the designer and software designer are addressing the program, mm -hmm. which is good because you make better software with that. Mm -hmm. And I think, but that's one of the points that I think Alexander missed because he said, "Well, you're not having, you don't focus on the end user," which I think is a well. We, we don't do it, but it's actually the patterns that we have in software design are are designed so that the, the programmer feels better. I would argue that you did, um, and, and this is why I'm, I'm, and I will come to that at the end. I will return to that um, because I, what I've done is I structured through the 2012 book, and so I believe the method is fully described in the 2012 book where he includes the people and he does own negotiation. So I'll come back to that. Um, so 1978 in 1991, um, there's the idea that comes from um, uh, Nathan and Mitroff, Mitroff from the systems community, and we start talking about, well, okay, now how is it, what is it you're negotiating with? You have an organization, and this is a social sense, right? You have the organization set around the organization, the industry, inter-organization, and so now you're dealing with negotiating with all these things simultaneously. That's what, that's what it's like to be in business or in organization science. In um, 2005, and this was resulting from a 2003 uh, paper at the ISSS meeting in the system science community, um, I was a co-author on this work, and the idea was about um, negotiated order in network form organizations, which is primarily social. And there's two types of order that we were talking about there. One was negotiated order, as I've described here, and the other is legal order, which is rules. Okay? And the rules get set up more in the sense that Alexander got uh, described them, that there are rules of law that you put up, and then the rest is negotiated. So the, the sort of result you get here is that, uh, and the, the actual case study that we're looking at was um, the Linux development, Linux development, open source development projects. So how many rules do you actually need to put into an open source community to have a function? And you really don't, it's not like you know the, the law of a country, it's actually a relatively few number of protocols they have where they, they uh, have licensing, um, they have some practices, and then the rest is being negotiated. So in the next release of Linux, what goes in or what doesn't go in, it's negotiated. Because it's like, well, we could put that function in, but it hasn't been well tested, we decide to do it, leave it in, put it out, all those sorts of things. So we had this um, idea that there's a balance between legal order, the rules you put in place, and negotiated order, which are things that you do on the fly depending on what the environment is like. Now in that respect, this side of negotiating order with is much more like timeless way of building. Because it's like piecemeal growth. Piecemeal growth you negotiate with what you have built in front of you, whereas the pattern language is much more like legal order or creating order of. Okay. So here I have a, a again about the contradictions or ambiguities of Christopher Alexander's writing because you're kind of distinguishing the, the, the orientation of, of the timeless way of building and, and the pattern language, yeah. whereas I had understood that one was the theory and the, the other one was the practice, so that they were meant to, to convey the same thing. Uh, well, different different aspects of the same project, let's say. Yes, but one being the, the practical application of the, the second being the practical application of the first. So, so you're saying that there was a kind of a shift? No, no, no. I, I wouldn't put the division that way. I would put the, the so again, sorry to refer to systems theory. So, so uh, there is structure and there is process. In systems theory, structure is arrangement in space, and process is arrangement in time. 
So what happens is that the pattern language is primarily about structure, and timeless way of building is primarily about process. But you need both. And, and so just at this at Purple Sock last week, when I was talking to Max Jacobson, if you actually look at the numbering of the volumes of uh, the, from the Center for Environmental Structure, where the books are published, the timeless way of order is volume one. Yeah, the timeless way of building. Timeless way of building. Timeless way of building is, yeah. is volume one. Yes, but it's actually 1979 it was released. Pattern language came out in 1977. So they were issued out of order, and what Max told me is that in some respects, Alexander was slowing down the release of, uh, of the timeless way of, of, of building because he, he wanted to get more pattern, pattern language done. So he wanted more structure done before he published the, um, uh, the process. I think it's somewhere in the former, one of the two books, he also says that why. Yes, yes. Why he published it in that order. Yeah. So, so you you were saying that in 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 creating order of your in the structure and negotiating order with your in the process, then yes, more, more more or less. <laughs> uh, not completely because you end up now, now here here is the problem in system theory. That's a, this is always a skill testing question. Which comes first, process or structure? And it's so. Uh -huh. What he says is pattern um, length of. Pattern is both a thing in the process. That's what Alexander says. Okay. So he says the pattern <coughs> that he has in pattern life is both okay. the thing that you create and, and the process how to create it. And he also says that the, the pattern language is the gate. Okay. Right. So that is the way you have to go through the pattern language. That's the process. So it's not a single pattern, it's just using the, the path through the pattern language that builds the thing. Uh, the, the, so, so in systems theory, so I was in systems theory for about eight years before I thought I walked with D.A. Swanson, and I asked him which comes first, process or structure, and he says, it's obvious, isn't it? I said, no, it's not obvious. He said, process comes first. I was like, really? I said, why is that? It's because um, the process, structure is the slowest changing process ever. Um, and so to us, a mountain is a structure, but actually a mountain changes. So, so, so you end up in this duality between structure and process on scales of time, um, and, and which is more durable in that in, in that sense. Um, so, so there's a little bit of confusion here. So, uh, so speaking of leans, creating order of is I. I'm not going to go as far as saying it's strictly about structure and not in saying this is strictly about uh, and negotiating or strictly about process. It's like I say it's more <coughs> for each, but we, we kind of end up now having to redefine terms and what do you mean by that sort of stuff. So, yeah, because yeah, actually you have you have structure which is a slower, slow changing. Process. I mean, the pro the structure that is the result of, of an evolution of something. Mm -hmm. Like you can say that some informal institutions or structures that 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 are the result of some dynamics of systems. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, you design structures because you want them to generate some source. Right. So now you say structure generating process. Yes. Right. Well. Yes, I know. Yes. yes. And so, uh, so, no, but the design act, I mean, that, that so you apply the, the design act to, 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 to create a structure. So, so there's the design structure, or there's the end, or there's the, the emergent structure. That's what I. The two types of structures, so the, the design structure can come the, first. The intended or the deliberate structure. Yeah, yeah the yeah. deliberate structure can come first, but the emergent structure Going with it. Yes. comes after. Uh, no, it comes at the same time. So. Oh, after the process, yeah. Well, okay. yes. After a process. <laughs> yeah. <Okay>. Yes. <laughs> this, this gets confusing. It does. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm now going to talk about frames of reference. Um, I don't know if I really want to do this, but uh, it's kind of necessary. So um, 
the, the question would be, and this is really a, a scientific uh, philosophy of science question, so if anyone really tries to believe, so I'm not <laughs> insulted by this. Um, six general elements constitute a frame of reference. Uh, the one I'm going to do is fill this in one by one because um, the fonts get pretty small pretty fast. But there are six, so this is from um, uh, uh, Srivasta and uh, Mitroff in 1984. Uh, again, this is coming through systems theory. Um, there's, there is six elements of frames of reference. First, the cognitive elements, cognitive operators, reality test, domain of inquiry, degree of articulation, metaphor. So I have to explain each one of these, like I'll go step through them with you. Okay, what are cognitive elements? The most basic units of people, person's belief systems, they include one of the same cognitive categories and bits of data that take for granted or required so basic they're beyond doubt. These primitive cognitive elements may be regarded as the fundamental use of information that support a person's inquiring system or concept of the world. Okay, so we're down at the level now, and, and after, I, I will eventually get to this where we start talking about creating order of versus negotiating order with, and we'll, we'll step through each one of these, you know, end up with a left-right sort of thing. But the cognitive elements, in effect, are the things that we take for granted in the system. The cognitive auto operators, Refer to the methods by which individuals order and rearrange and make meaning out of large amounts of data. Cognitive operators include classification schemes, models, analytic devices, and common sense theories, which, with which individuals broadly approach inquiry. So, if we we just had a, uh, I was working with, with the um, group that was discussing uh, pattern mining. So, in the first cognitive uh, elements, it would be okay. So, what would you consider a pattern? Um, then the next one would be how would you classify them together or reduce it? That's how you create the, uh, the logical of it, the logicality of it. Reality test. Guarantee or validate the realness of the cognitive elements, cognitive operators, and the knowledge of the information itself. So the, in effect, you've got the cognitive elements, which are the input, the cognitive operators, which are the process in which they're going through, and the knowledge information itself, which is the result. They validate knowledge and the process of inquiry by expressing symbolically the legitimate connections with the critical shared social and cultural experiences. Collective social and cultural experiences form the basis of these reality tests. Um, so again, we're just being top of mind, we just had this workshop where we're talking about, um, about pattern mining using the JK techniques and they come from a Japanese context. And one of the questions we're having was, is that just a Japanese context, or is there more than that than it works in multiple contexts? But the reality test, what whether they hang together or hang together. Domain of inquiry refers not to the limits of a specific instance of inquiry, but to the limits of the entire set of cognitive maps that individuals use in inquiry and generation. The breadth of inquiries is a function of individuals' knowledge base and their appreciation of alternative reference frames that are, is the reflexivity in inquiry. So this, this is, in effect, um, bringing together multiple people to, to construct a view of the world. Right? Um, so when we talk about domain of inquiry, the domain of inquiry is what we decide it's going to be. Um, it, you know, this would be, if you're going to design a pattern language, what is the scope of the pattern language? Is a pattern language for built environments only? Is it only for building software? Is it only for social change? Or can we actually look at other domains? Uh, or what's the scope of the domain? Are you cognitive in, in this frame? Yeah. Are the are patterns cognitive elements in this frame? Are they cognitive operators in this frame? So patterns, in, if you take this frame, if you take individual patterns, they would be cognitive elements, number one. Okay. Then combining the patterns would be cognitive operations. Okay. The reality test would be whether they can actually fit together or not fit together, because the premise is, if you go back to architecture, are you going to put a roof on something with no supporting structure? Uh, domain of inquiry then would be uh, now are we going to judge the uh, whether the house is a good house? Are we going to judge it as people who are constructing it or are people living in it? So what is the domain of inquiry? Yes, or are we going to use also practice or a domain or are we going to work across disciplines? Etc.? Yes, exactly. exactly. Degree of articulation. So the degree to which assumptions and the other four elements have been articulated and codified 
It also reflects the degree to which the individual's frame of reference will be and can be shared by others. Um, this is the part where, we, where it's reflexive in the pattern language. Uh, and um, if we are going to mature, and I, I, I kind of hear this from um, the description this morning about moving from the, from the leader of uh, writers' workshops, moving from being just a traffic cop to being a teacher, is that you, is when you're a teacher, you tend to bring out the thinking of other people. So we're reading these things, and, and one way of just having a traffic cop would be, you know, go around and circle and have people discuss what they see in the writing. The other would be is that someone with more experience would now go, well, do they mean, do you think they mean this or do you think they mean that? Because if they mean A, then we go this direction, if they mean B, we go this other direction. So there are, is uh, a lot of uh, critical thinking that happens in this phase. And I think that, um, that, that that has to be more, or it should be better articulated, it should be more expressed than, than what we've seen today. And finally, metaphors. Embedded in the language and jargon used by individuals, they per permit this symbolic representation of the organizational world in meaningful ways. They go on being uh, beyond embellishments of language by stimulating the understanding of assumptions mm -hmm. through creative process of comparison and crossing images. They describe unnameable characteristics in individuals' frame of reference by drawing implicit analogies with known objects and experiences, thereby explicating and clarifying obscure and nebulous aspects of the frame of reference. So um, this is where we start getting into a little bit of, of tricky territory when we describe the world, because our words are never enough. It's never the full reality. And so I think I heard something like we speak something like uh, uh, something like 22 metaphors an hour or something like that. Like it's, 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 it's some incredible number that people speak in metaphors all the time. And we communicate in metaphors because it's richer and faster. And so if I say this is, if we, we, we build this, we build software like we build a house. Or if you actually then go over to um, Booch, they said, well, actually, building software is like building a river. And, you know, this sort of stuff, it changes the way you think about it. So we have to be careful about, about this. So now that I've outlined, yes. So but if we get into general systems theory and the isomorphism. Yes. So you'll put it at which level? Okay. Um, so, uh, Helene is speaking about um, the pursuit of general systems theory, which is they have isomorphies, which means some things that work across all types of systems. Mechanical systems, biological systems, you know, social systems, ecology, if you name it, all types of systems. There are not many isomorphies, and they're, and they're really hard to express. Um, so, Len from colleagues kind of leads this sort of work. Um, metaphors are not models. And general system theory deals with models. Uh, hopefully the models don't break down, because what happens at a certain point when people say, uh, they make a metaphor, and so um, uh, you know, I got hit by a Mack truck, right? I had a flu, I got hit by a Mack truck. Uh, that, that sort of thing, you didn't literally get hit by a truck, you got feeling that way. Building a model of someone having a flu and getting hit by a truck is not a really helpful thing. The general system theory is about models, it's not about metaphors. Yeah, but you could argue that the model is a kind of metaphor brought to perfection or close to whatever you mean. Well, no, no, that, and that's why Boulding had, um, had categorizations in the skeleton of science, is because there, there are properties that are in human systems that are not in machines and clockworks and these sorts of descriptions. So that doesn't mean that there aren't some isomorphies or common things across systems, but at, at different levels of systems, there are special properties. Okay, so that's the six all together in smaller font. Okay, what we're gonna do now is put these frames of reference as a tool. So my question is, um, what are the differences and complements we start thinking about uh, create a order of a negotiating order with. Okay, so this is trying to now take, um, it, within the original paper that um, uh, Srini Svada and Mitrov had, they actually had a, a, um, a description, 
And what I try to do is take that description and adapt it for pattern language. And so what are the cognitive elements um, that I, I feel that are in the pattern language literature? What are the parts? There's primacy for a kid of parts. Each pattern is a rule which describes what you have to do to generate the entity for which it defines. Uh, intellectual commitment towards wholeness, beauty, and or quality that are named in a common pattern language cross community. So if you're creating order of, you're in the pattern language, you're kind of operating with that. When you're dealing with negotiating order with, the primacy is not on the kids' parts. The primacy is on engagement with the constituents and adjusting plans situated in reality rather than modeled. Intellectual commitment to piecemeal growth, sequencing from broad features down through the just detailed secondary features. So you can kind of see now this one on the left is more pattern language. This more on the right is more time of way of building. Yeah. The trouble with the time of way of building is kind of like thinking that so that because the patterns tell you what to do. And the other one does it does tell you on something at the level, so that that uh, as a master you can do it, but then you don't need the advice because you're a master already. Um they so, also so the patterns help you to become that master because you're stuck with using what worked before. Go ahead, go ahead. You're saying, Christian, that the, the, the negotiating model with is, is already in the state of a master. That's what you're but saying. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You no, I, 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 right. no, no, yes, it has to be, you have to have a master, some form of mastery, too. Yeah, or yeah. the so, pattern is interesting, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the thing. If you can play uh, literacy, if you can play an instrument very well, can start improvising and you can start creating new tunes. Um, the, I, I think the issue, and, and as we move farther along, the issue is if you are dealing in a non material world and you're dealing with social, then there are maybe fewer structural elements for you to work with. And so a lot of social work relies on process rather than relying on, um, on the kit of parts. So if you take medicine, um, does medicine rely more on the kit of parts or the process? Well, when they give you medicine, they don't sure what the medicine's going to work. They tell you come back in a week and let us know how that drug is doing for you. So the, the frame that's a negotiating order with allows you to deal with more uncertainty than um, the kit of parts. Now, the kit of parts, you can choose which part you use. Uh, right, the medicine that, uh, that, that you are uh, prescribed the specific medicine that's the pattern, right? So because you got the uh, you got the diagnosis, but you get the flu. Yes, that's your context. You get a specific symptoms. What do you do? Oh, uh, what's the name? You think this? Uh, schnapps. Not schnapps. <laughs> <laughs> So, 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 so now, now you get into uh, whether you'd rather deal with Dr. Google or a real doctor. Because the Dr. Google would probably be more on the left side, and dealing with a doctor is more like dealing with the right side, right? Um, so one of the things I learned recently about, um, uh, about why they do medical histories, and every time, every time you go to the doctor, they seem to ask you the same questions. You know, and it's like, you know, isn't this in the records? And, and apparently they do that because they don't trust you. Uh, first, firstly, things may have changed, but secondly, they don't trust that you actually, that the records are correct. Because unless it's the same doctor making it over and over again, it's possible the other doctor made a mistake. Um, so, yeah, it's... So, so but I think, you know, I think it's good. So the medical example is a very good one. Because I, I remember some time ago, who used to write patterns in a medical way, like symptoms, uh, some, some still do it, and side effects, okay. or uh, um, uh, what the uh, right. count, counter indications, you know, <laughs> this kind of thing, like you shouldn't do it if, if, you, if this is showing up. And I think the difference between the two is what, what feedback cycle do you have? So do yeah. you really uh, say, okay, oh, yeah, I see the symptoms, bound, they you got it, and see you again in one week, or is it more like, okay, I try out this, and that is the negotiation part. 
and it's where you constantly evaluate yeah, yeah. Uh, whether you're heading to the right direction. Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and, and so again, I'm not trying to say that one is right and one is wrong. It's just trying to understand a little bit more yeah. what's going on between the two. Yeah. Okay, cognitive operators. So you kind of got the kit of parts over here. So what are you trying to do? Synthesize form assembling patterns from a semi-lattice structure toward generating a coherent whole. So there was an article early in, um, in Alexander's career, uh, career called uh, A City is Not a Tree. And the idea behind City is Not a Tree was that people were thinking that you could design a city by deconstructing it into a tree structure. In effect, you start off with the stuff at the large and go all the way down to the bottom. And what he said, it's a semi-lattice. So you have a tree, but then it's not that it's all top to bottom, you're going to end up at the bottom where things cross over. So you have a, if it, if it was a, a, a tree structure, then when you get to the leaves, it only comes off one branch. But in effect, in a semi-lattice, that leaf could be connected to multiple branches. That was the idea of a semi-lattice. So the kit of parts gets more complicated. But there is the idea of um, synthesizing form where you have um, more the big structures at the top and the small structures at the bottom. This is something I haven't seen that much in pattern lighting with generation. But if you look at Christopher Alexander's work, he starts off, well, you know, a pattern line did a subtitle with the uh, buildings, towns, and construction. And so he starts off, the first patterns are towns. He starts off with large scale things first, and then he goes down to small things, and you all go down to interior decorating. Right? Um, so that is the, the original um, frame of reference. Converging on a collective subjective judgment that is that one configuration is superior to another, Turkish carpets. And so we always get, and here Gabriel talk about the carpet on the left and the carpet on the right, um, that people will generally agree the carpet on the left is more beautiful or more coherent or speaks more to you, uh, whatever that's going to be. Uh, the cognitive operators under negotiating order with, reviewing and adjusting the pattern language with a wide variety of stakeholders towards explicit approval. Now this shows up specifically in the uh, 2012 book, uh, in the battle book, because um, we have this now we have this question about pattern language, and from what I've seen from Alexander's practice, every time he goes on a new project, he creates a pattern language with that community. He does not take the patterns that he wrote in the book and then reapply them. Right. Um, you also have now fitting centers on the faster pacing layers, which is the building, on the slower pacing layers, the land. I'll come back to that again in the, in the, in the patterns, but there are multiple patterns going on, and so you have the idea of scale um, and things working simultaneously. So what Jeff Pong taught in the previous section, so I found out I think it was doing this all the time, but it's not something new. He did it even before he wrote the pattern language, mm -hmm. using new pattern languages for each project. I think that's one of the shortcomings of the software community that patterns always have to be generalized patterns, like two or three. And I always thought that patterns are a really good tool to create new projects as well. We had an interesting uh, discussion in a writing group this morning about uh, pattern language being a set of requirements for designing yeah, right. something. And this is what came to my mind when you, with what you just uh, said, uh, Christian. Uh, yeah. yeah, that, that would tend to put it more on the left than the right. Yeah, because when, when, when you're saying it's um, that's requirements, then that's more like rules than negotiating. You can't negotiate requirements per se. I, I personally, having spent a Fair amount of career as a business architect, I said I never believe in requirements. I only negotiate everything with every client. Well, then, what's the pattern language in the, on, the, on the right then? Hmm? I mean, it's, it's okay, it's over the guidelines then. Well, no, so. so um, yeah, requirements not being requirements, but being. Uh, I mean, yeah. If yeah, you take so, it literally, if requirements mean if you want to do that, it would be good if you had that. Like not being, it has to be 
Yeah, well, like well, yes. being, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, it's, it's dangerous to send me on a requirements engagement, but I'll come back and I'll say, I'll say things like, um, okay, tax law is a requirement, no, uh, you know, this sort of stuff, like you, you cannot break these laws, those are requirements. No, no, right? I'm talking about requirement as in software requirements, like I like the, the, no, the, the button yeah. to be uh, on the right or on the left. Yeah, but to, yeah, requ requirements requirement. are typically either pass fail, right? So mm -hmm. there, there's the issue when you do a requirement, it's pass fail, mm -hmm. where negotiated things are not pass fail. There's specific types of forces. Yeah. There are more forces, um, there are different types of forces. Material tests. Reality, reality, reality test. So in creating order of material, or which I mean hard, empirical, observable, and observable verifiable proofs, superiority as a consensus among the experts, as opposed to negotiating with non-material, soft pragmatic value, livability, maintainability over time, enjoyment by beneficiaries or occupants or users. So, um, so this side, this side is much more. Um, in the construction of things that you can actually see. Um, this kind of reflects the idea of, again, when you're working with a group of people creating a new pattern language every time. Hmm. So what is real? Like what, how, how do you know that this is a good pattern language that will create a new, a good building? Is it okay if I... Yeah, please, please. So the, on the right hand side, you you focus on the cube, kind of view cube or quality cube with our table. I think um, that's different level. I think if you look, look at the two categories, you, uh, I think the test of uh, on the left hand side, you're testing a theory. If, if you see pattern of theory, yeah. On the right hand side, you're testing the design as it is developed. The process. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's all the time. So you work a lot. Conversation with the advertiser. Yeah. The other thing, right? So you're, that is where you're negotiating. You think, well, and let's, so the pattern would be this kind of setup of the chairs. That is, a, you can test that you say, well, this setup is good for, for, for good collaboration. On the right hand side, you would just say, okay, I just ah, I put it there. So you're doing all this testing where you have the negotiation. You say, well, let's do it us until we have the good setup for the collaboration. And the beauty can be in both. So yeah, say, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of we do have collaboration, but it's not as beauty as the right or yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Because so I would have these two levels. So, so the it is more difficult to test the, the beauty level. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, so actually, at, at Purple Sock, the uh, the plenary on the last day was excellent. So, good uh, answer, Brody. I think yeah. all, all the objective stuff. I hadn't seen that before. That was that was really uh, really enlightening. Christian, uh, but I, I agree with what you said. But you're assuming that um, the priority was collaboration. So meaning we're putting the chairs for collaboration. So mm -hmm. that was our goal. Suppose we wanted to put the chairs for comfort. Well, you know we're kind of close here. You know, and maybe I mean I sat here because I walked in late. You know, yeah. and so I went. And so, I don't know that you can just, I, I, I guess, where does the goal fit in all this, you know, in the design? Because you're, you immediately jump to collaboration, and I look around here and see this doesn't look very comfortable, you know. Yeah, that's what I said. It's this is for different levels. So if you can have, um, uh, different qualities, but, but on the left hand side, you say, well, I have captured something that has worked already in the past. For um, collaboration. Well, yeah, uh, just an example. Okay, okay, so, I, I get to know. And on the other side, you say, I don't know yet what is the good solution. I just try it. But I don't try it theoretically. I negotiate by trying to uh, put things up and say, oh, how it works out. So, so the first step could have been just having the chairs here random and then ask people to sit where they're comfortable and more process-oriented things. Yeah, and I just can't get, because some people would have been 
concern about comfort and other people would have been concerned about let's get a collaborative environment we would have had competing goals i mean that's something i always thought about when you get competing goals how do you get things that actually build with yeah. beauty when you have competing goals and i think the chair is a perfect example yeah yeah and and so the, when, you, when you get the competing goals then you're negotiating with right you're really having to negotiate with across the goals yeah. and uh, so the pattern is one Fit, well, one stable outcome of this negotiation process. So I think the way I see the pattern, how, how do patterns, how, how, how did they develop? It could be that somebody's sitting there and just experimenting on the set of tables, uh, the chairs. Uh, it could be that by accident you have the right setup. Or uh, it could be that you have just Observe them many, many times and you just make the right setup. So, pattern is something where you capture this is one stable configuration. There might be other ones, it's one that I just see and, and I can copy and, and, and recreate. And the right hand side is more like, okay, I start without these patterns, I just try to get them. But if I have already a good solution, it's, it's good to know that solution. And then I can make a deliberate decision to, to look for a new one or change the existing one. So yes. Can I just ask one question? That I'm new to this pattern as well. Okay. So, from what's going on, I recognize that the left side is a pattern language, the right side is, isn't. Okay. Uh, it, so, I, I think the more correct way of saying this is the left side is more like the pattern language book. A pattern language book, and the right side is more like the timeless way of building book. So, is it like the left side is more goal directed? Like you have a goal and you organize things and you create your order in in relation to your goal, and the other side is like purpose seeking in the sense that you kind of navigate in adaptive ways. Uh, yeah, no, adaptive I, ways to to kind of reach a, 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 a kind of ideal form that's not totally spelled out. I, I wouldn't put it exactly that way, um, but if you talk about piecemeal growth, piecemeal growth comes out of timeless way and it's not really in the pattern language. Great. Uh, the problem with the pattern language, that was, mm -hmm. uh, was the problem with natural order is that the goals are very, very abstract. They are the 15 fundamental properties. They say, okay, let's we can make this place more, let's make it up next early. How can we make this place more beautiful? So you would start with any of the 15 properties because they have not been ordered. So you could say, how could we make more local symmetries, for example? So one would be like always two chairs together so that at least two people sit together. That would be a local symmetry. Better not. <laughs> 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 this is what. I'm, so right. So yeah. Well, I, I, I increase increase the fifteen properties. Uh, that, that is what I, I'm saying. Yeah. Like. So, so one of the issues I, I don't feel I don't deal with physical space very often. Uh, well, but so, that's the problem. It's all about physical space. Yeah, it's, it's all about physical space. space. Yes. Yes. Oh, right. Right. You also say you have different chairs in the room. One from yeah. you know not just all kinds. But for example, like this, no, no. So you're not integrated well, you're not integrated, but you're sitting in a different room, right? So yeah. You're, you're sitting alone, right? I know. So this is like, uh, it would be a violation of a level of scale. So, uh, you know, we have this <laughs> big audience and you're sitting quite alone there. Yeah. I still so say it would be an interesting um, experiment to just tell people to walk in and put their chairs down. And some people might put them back over there because they want to see outside. Yeah. As I did once when I was given the opportunity yeah. when I was in wine country at a conference. And I go, I'm putting my chair where I can just see the beauty, right? Other people would get close. Other people would say, walk in late and put theirs up. Well, now you're talking like, uh, you're talking forces, which is our, what we always do, which is nice thing. That is left, uh, that's gone in the nature of forces. There's no more, there's only these 15 properties. It's not, and there's so many different forces. And like, like, yes, like, oh, 
Yeah. I know I'm looking at this is also my nice book there. That that would be a good thing to bring up. That's why I'm saying here you can't see both. It's exactly right. That is the point. I, 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 I thought about going over there and just sitting in the corner, but it just seems so dark. So I yeah. yeah. I don't I didn't have that conscious thought of the, the, the bringing up of, of, of not having force in nature and order would be a good question for Michael to be happy on the last day uh, because he's all about that. Okay, domain of inquiry, um, creating order of, ranging of contexts where experiences with desirable features have proven historically successful and replicable, and um, in negotiating order, situated conditions on which the work is platform priorities and preferences of the specific client. So again, we're talking about something that's durable across multiple engagements or projects uh, versus something that's done very specifically uh, at certain points in time. So do you create the pattern language as a catalog, uh, or do you create it with each client individually? And, and it gets to be an interesting, um, interesting challenge because um, one of the questions I got asked is, is um, how do we get people to use pattern language? And one of the ways could be not bringing the pattern catalog, because as an organization consultant, sometimes you come in and you use the words of the client, and you use only their words, and, and, and that's much more powerful to them. And I've, I've actually done engagements where it's like, wow, I would never have used that word, I would never describe it that way, but that's what it means to those people in the organization, so I have to use their words that's being on the right side, where it's very situated. Uh, but that's not replicable. That's not replicable, because the next time I go to another client, it's kind of like, okay, conceptually it's the same thing, but the words are all different, and I have to do um, the over again. Okay, Degree of articulation. High explicit articulation of a pattern language that forms rules for design, construction, and maintenance. Low implicit articulation of pattern language methods for transmission through rep, uh, apprenticeship, um, as opposed to in negotiating or with. Low implicit articulation of criteria for evaluation. Client can refine the preferences as appreciation deepens. That's because the client doesn't know what they want until you start telling them, this is what you said, and they go, that's what I said, but that's not what I mean. High explicit articulation of desirable organizational individual practices and our, and our cyclical procedures. So going through and actually following this method is kind of like, um, trust me with the method, we'll get, to get your result in the end. So, but you're not using a pattern language on the right side, or you are? No, you, you create a pattern language with the client. Okay, each time. Right. But yes, but, but it's, okay. it's only the trick then, is like, can you walk in with any patterns at all? Or do you have to actually create it with the people there? So my, my claim, if I was being paid for it, um, I would actually probably not walk in with a pattern language and say, you know, we need to create a pattern language in your language. So if I'm working with a bank, and it's like, okay, I need a pattern language for banking, you don't have one, okay. A pattern language for healthcare, no, I'll probably come in and do another pattern language. So I'm not going to create a standard pattern language for everyone. Can you just, I have a moment of confusion here. Okay, Can back you up. just read, no, it's okay. okay. You can stay on the new one, okay. It's, can you just recap, it's creating order of and negotiating order with what? Pattern language? No, that's, no, no. The, the, the reason is, it's, it's explicit. Order it's, of? No, the, the, I'm, I'm playing a trick here, which is the book is called The Nature of Order. If the book is called The Nature of Order, what is the nature of order? Yeah. There's multiple ways of, of getting to order. One is creating order of whatever the parts are. So I'm being very general here. Um, okay, but what's implied after of is, is, is the order of the things that you're creating, right? <laughs> All of a Cre sudden, creating order of the, create, so, okay. Creating order of the parts of the system, so I'm being explicit. Okay. And this is generally creating order with um, with parts of the environment. Okay. Okay. But that's not necessarily a strict rule because there are parts of the environment you might be using in your system, so that you create order of the with part of the environment, and also negotiating order with 
There's also a lot of ambiguity inside the system, so you could be negotiating inside your system as well. But you're in a part of the wall. Okay, the metaphors. Um, now, the strange thing is, <laughs> on, the, on the left side, timeless way, holism, and aesthetics. On the right side, the metaphors are more about living system, harmony, and sequences. And this is why I haven't actually used the title right up top where you actually start talking about which one is more like a pattern language more, and more like, um, uh, more like a time of way of building because the, the metaphors that go through them, um, there's much more about progress and uh, process here when you talk about living system because the living system changes. Uh, harmony and sequences, particularly sequences are over time. Whereas timeless way, if you actually think about timeless way, timeless is idealism, philosophically, because there is no time there. Right? That's why it's called the timeless way. And holism and aesthetics come in um, within that. So on the on the left side, is there an ideal pattern or ideal construction? Um, the, the and again, this comes down to the way architects approach it. Is there an ideal building? And the left would say there is a beautiful ideal building. On the right, it would say, well, it evolves over time. So when you say ideal, do you mean at what point in time? I'm not sure whether it's a pattern of the pattern. All the pattern of the pattern? Did Alexander say the pattern of the pattern? The time, timeless way of building, so. Yeah, yeah, but that's not completely. It's building. The timeless, the timeless way is, is uh, the timeless way is the method. Yes. Right. That is timeless. Yeah, but, but, but timeless means there's no time, which means idealism. Universal. Universal. Yeah. Yes. And that, I think that's what it is. That is, if you use uh, the, uh, the pattern theory or the pattern approach, it's basically a timeless thing. Yes. Like taking complete complex into account, understanding the forces, the forces shape the form. Uh, that is the time. I think it's like the, uh, the specific way of building that's timeless. I'm not sure where. I think but the timeless comes from the fact that it dates back, as I understand it, it dates back to immemorial times. Well, well, the, 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 the way of building in a, in a uh, like the, the using uh, tacit knowledge to build. But as I understood it, it's using uh, 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 a non-explicit tacit knowledge of building that is immemorial and date back in time, so it's timeless because it dates no, back. No, no, as soon as you said date back in time, you put time in it. And so, so timeless, in my interpretation, we can debate this yeah. later, timeless to me means ideal. And, and so, so in, in system theory, this, we end up running across it with Aikoff, and with, uh, Aikoff in particular was idealist. Okay, so, so there's no room for relativism when you're talking about absolute beauty, because there is an absolute beauty. The people on the right would say there's no such thing as absolute beauty. It depends on the situation, depends on who's evaluating it. But, but the thing is, it's the time we are building and not buildings, mm -hmm. right? But that means there, that there's a top, there is a universal way of building. Yeah. 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 Which, which is, could be. which is to, to embedded <laughs> in, in 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 the human psyche. I mean. It's interesting because I, I, I lived in, for several years in Indonesia and I was kind of looking at ethnographic stuff and ways of building mm -hmm. and how the, the, the constructions on tiles you know, on the, and the, the, the shapes of the, of the houses and, the, and the, the way that it was almost like a ship was, was all over the Pacific in, in all different types of ethnies, and it was a, a form of a, of a universal, or they were calling it an archetypal way of building houses over, over thousands uh, or hundreds of years. So, so that was the timeless way. For the Indonesians. 
No, no, no. Not only in the regions, like in China, in South China, in, in all the, the Pacific uh, rim. So probably there were some some migrations and some some moves that all came from from similar places, but it had it had uh, maintained. I mean, the, the the ways of building have been uh, conserved for, for 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 generations and generations and generations, and I think that they were also found in other parts of, of the world as well. So so to me, it was a. It, it, there was some form of, of, of really not idealistic universals that were there and that were that were uh, facts. I mean, uh, proven. Uh, so, so, um, so let, let me let me help the distinction. So, my friend David Hawk likes the book. Um, there's a book called Building the Unfinished. Uh, if you are building the unfinished, you cannot be building the ideal because it's unfinished. And, and I'm not talking about ideals here. You are. No, no, I know. But <laughs> again, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get on the yes. left side, right? Yes. And, and so, so you, you, it's a philosophical discussion about idealism mm -hmm. um, and whether you can pursue idealism or not. And so, just philosophically, you end up falling one side or the other and making decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Last thing, there's no ideals. Okay, um, so we covered those. Now, how do we use this in practice? Okay, the Aishin project. Now, this is the steps um, that I've interpreted. They actually come from the section titles within the, uh, the Battle for a Life and Beauty book. So what, how do you actually do pattern language? How, how did Christopher Alexander actually execute on this in 1985? So firstly, interview on hopes and dreams. So he went and spoke to teachers, he spoke to the students, spoke to parents, uh, people living in the neighborhood, and interviewed them on what they wanted in this new college, high school campus in Japan. Number two, make a poetic vision as first sketch of a pattern language. Um, at, at this point, he's just trying to get the feedback from people, which is, we interviewed all these people, this is the sort of thing we heard, um, then when he's done that, uh, make a rudimentary pattern language physically coherent. So you need to have all the parts actually of the site. So they want a judo hall, they want a great hall, they want a library, they want classrooms. You have to make, put all that stuff on the property. Number four, revise, revise the language through discussion. At this point, you're actually going in and showing people the pattern language, getting bored, saying we can actually build this. We're now talking about concrete places. Number five, obtain approval of the pattern language. So before he moves ahead, this is the pattern language we constructed. Number six, renegotiate the pattern language with space and money within budget. What he does, he takes the pattern language and says, okay, well, um, if we were to construct a judo hall, a judo hall needs this much space. You have a library that has this much books, has this much space. You work through it all, and it turns out there's like 30% larger, 30, the, the needs of the building are more than the, the site will actually handle, right? So he comes in and, and says, you need to shave off and make this, make the, your wants and needs fit into the building and the budget, fill down the land and the budget. Um, and so initially, what you can do is you can add more space to something, but only if you reduce it from someplace else. And what he did was just cut 30% off everything. And so 30% too big, we're gonna cut space, 30% off everything, and now it fits on the property. If you want more, you'll have to make that trade off. Number seven, and this is the interesting part that um, I find that um, that we really don't do in the pattern community. Find the system of centers in the pattern language and the places in the land, combine them. So you've got a slower moving layer, which is the land, and there's a, uh, a trough in the land. So if you're gonna put in um, a pool or you know, some water feature there, there's a natural place to do it. There's a ridge that has a better view, and then you have all the buildings and try to put them in. And uh, he actually writes about this and shows sketches in the book. And originally, the entrance to the property was on the south. And that's the way they planned it for a long time. But when they actually started working with the system of centers, 
The only way they could get the buildings to fit was to put the entrance on the east side, not on the south side. So he's got the patterns in the land and the patterns on the buildings. He's rotating them. And then finally, adjust the site plan on the building itself, not on models. So he doesn't do a drop blueprint. He goes out and puts flags on the land where he thinks things are going to be. And here's the photographs of that. They, they uh, came and took down the, the flags. They put up new flags every day because the flags were coming down. They had to work through that. So that is my interpretation. If other people would like to work through it. This is the only place I've seen in Alexander's writings where you get all the way down to construction to actually building it. And so in my history as a methodologist, I actually don't, I try to not pay attention so much to what people say. I try to pay more attention to what they do and then interpret back in. So this is what I see in my recommended for 2012. Take that as the baseline. Okay, so what happens when we try looking through these creating order of and creating uh, negotiating order with? So interviewing on hopes and dreams. So what, you, what you're doing here is a rough pattern language draft text of the site building the placements. You're negotiating through interviewing um, engagement through interviewing students, uh, teachers, and administration. Second, make the poetic vision. The preliminary architectural text. Now these are not drawings, they're actually just text of the campus precinct, the streets, yards, hall, great hall, building and lawn, and negotiating with meanings and expressions of intent conveyed by teachers, staff, and students. Uh, an example of something that Alexander wrote was, a teacher said they wanted to be able to see the eyes of the student. That's you know, it has some subjective, that's what it means when you're actually looking at people, how light the room is, how far away it is. Um, it's a little bit different from, from the perfect poetic vision. Make the rudimentary pattern language physically coherent. Not to scale drawings of patterns with seven principles ensuring completeness of the language. Um, as compared to visual representation reflecting inclusion of the features from the dreams of the interviewees. He's trying to get traceability over here. He's trying to get all of the content on the uh, left side. Refine language for discussion. Refinement and further detailing of the pattern language and text. Discussions with the constituents confirming the concerns have been addressed. Uh, making sure that the process is going through that, that they've got the right idea. Approve, get obtain approval of the pattern language. Eight key centers, 110 patterns, uh, but the negotiating order with is now acceptance of the architects have appreciated the concerns and interests. So you've got the actual pattern language now of the property but what's important is that the architects have actually now got everything that the uh, teachers and the staff and the students actually wanted. Um, what's the eight key centers? Is the centers the fundamental property center? No, no, no. These are the no because he did it on the land. So the key property centers were uh, what do you call it? Oops, they were the actual buildings. All right, they, they, they were the buildings. So it was the, uh, you call it, the street, yards, great hall, buildings, lawn. Awesome, okay. So he's uh, concrete about that. Um, renegotiating it, so the trimmed estimate of indoor built space and outdoor coverage of the land within the, con the constraints of the physical boundaries and the financial constraints. And the process is participation and reallocating the spaces to conform to available resources to trade off the decisions. So you can, I'll give you more space in a building if you take more space out in another building. Find the system of centers in the pattern language, place the land, combine them. So you have geometric configuration of centers in the pattern language in a feasible, coherent whole. And you have the reality of the lands, like the ridge and the swamp, with abstractions of buildings just to be constructed. So, you know, what's real here? Uh, at this point, um, this is all abstract because they haven't built anything, but you still have the, the centers that he's trying to enforce within the internal coherent consistency of the pattern. Adjust the site plan, plan on the site itself. You do surrogate visualizations, which are marks and flags on the land to conform with pattern language. 
and you have progressive refinement of the pattern language into a physical reality. He's trying to move from the abstract into the physical. So I do recommend for, if you're new to pattern language, start with the 2012 book. It'll make things a lot easier. <laughs> okay, that's everything on one page. Now, disciplined agile delivery. Um, so I don't know how many of you have actually looked at Scott Ambler. Um, Scott Ambler, um, he had been writing about Agile for quite a while and ended up working at IBM for six years, producing a book and then leaving the company, which was interesting. But in effect, he wrote the idea of, uh, of this. And the question is, can we put this sort of stuff, we are at a uh, ACM conference, can we put the disciplined Agile delivery into this framework? So there are three phases, uh, inception phase, construction phase, and transition phase. Start off with identifying a project vision, scope, technical, it's this sort of thing. Now we're moving out of building construction into software construction. What does it look like when we do that? Um, actually, I think this is where I stopped working on this. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we start getting into the part because the <laughs> shop, it the takes more than to get this far. The workshop part. The workshop part, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, okay. but, uh, but also, um, the part of the motivation for this is I've been working on uh, service system thinking. And so uh, service system thinking is working in service systems, not in software systems. We have human elements. Um, but uh, at this point, I think you've been sitting for a while. Um, what do you want to do? Have you had enough? Do you want to discuss more ideas? You want to, well, it's up to you. We've got the silence right now. Just one personal question. Sure. Uh, checking my understanding of what I've just heard. Um, so, from from this transition, uh, from the left side, the pattern language. So Alexander uses the pattern language, and then he uses the uh, timeless ways of uh, building. It, it sounded like that to me. Um, a, a better. So let me try. Again. Precise on this. Uh, after 10 years of working, he published a pattern language in 1977, and he published uh, Thomas Way Building in 1979, and then in 1985 he constructed the Aishin Buildings, but took till 2012 to publish the book. Okay. Um, between the two, he wrote four volume book called The Nature of Order that has everyone confused. Uh, because it's difficult. It's, firstly, it's a huge book, um, and, uh, and and there's a lot to it. There's a lot of theory in it. Um, the the question of you know if Christopher Alexander was to advise you what to do, um, he at the ACM Oopsla conference in 1986, he said, "You guys are software people. I know nothing about software." Okay, so. Whose problem is that now? So that makes it our problem, right? Yeah. Um, so we end up in the situation where um, some people just take the pattern language directly and use it and say, well, it worked in buildings, it'll work in software. Uh, but there are others who go, well, you know, it's not really like a building, it's like, a, again, so Grady Booch says that, you know, it's like a river. Architecture is like a river. So I haven't answered your question at all. <laughs> um, but I think this is part of what we, we need to grapple with within the community as we're moving forward. And it's a maturity thing. So, so in, in, in Alexander's um, way of thinking, yes. would he divide these two, was, was he dividing these two ways of thinking? Just, just curious. So, his, so what, so speaking, so we just had a conference with, with Max Jacobson, and he was saying it's all about beauty. And so he, he, he asked me, it was, a funny, it was a funny sort of thing that happened. He actually came and asked me, okay, you visited the Aisha campus? I said, yes. Was it beautiful? And I paused, and he's going, wow. You know, if, you, if, you, if, if 
if, he, if Alexander put all his effort into doing this as a major life work and wrote a book on it, and you pause, what does that mean that it's not beautiful? I said, well, visiting the Aishin campus, I found the, the land beautiful. So, you know, he put a lake and he put the buildings up. Um, but he did this funny thing with all of the, um, all of the classrooms in that he used dark wood. And so there was this, this discussion about, um, about students. Then it, it, was, it was a construction for like medieval Japan. Like it was not modern Japan, and, and I made the comment that when I was there, uh, I went and they, they put an addition on the building, and we put the, when they put a new classroom in, it was all bright. So, um, the, the, the way I look at Christopher Alexander's work is he started with the, and this is the talk that I gave you, eventually there'll be a recording and a blog on my website uh, from the talk I gave last week, is he started off in 1964, with notes on a synthesis of form. And as a scientist, he, he wrote what he knew at that point in time. And as he progressed more, he started focusing on different issues and he, he changed the terms. And there's actually uh, uh, a change in language. So within the nature of order, he has um, structure, structure sustaining I forgot what the phrase is. Not looking on another slide. He had, in the in the um, scientific explanation to pattern language they published in 2002. He actually says uh, not structure enhancing holders. Structure, structure preserving. Yes. Yes. He changes the terms from structure preserving to wholeness preserving. Mm -hmm. And so he writes that specifically. And in effect, what he's saying is, if I had to go write it all over again, I would change my language. And so when you're reading Christopher Alexander over a long period of time, it's like, okay, um, there are people who are specifically anchored on either a pattern language or timeless way of building, but that's probably a trap to do either one. And, and this whole arc that goes on. Um, in, in the work I'm doing, I'm actually trying to get outside of that a little bit more and try to develop not only with Christopher Alexander, but with um, Horst Riddle on Wicked Problems on Ch West Churchill and Systems Approach. So, so that one, maybe we'll do that next year's talk. <laughs> because Chris was, Chris was at the one uh, we just did on Saturday, and uh, 90 minutes in, everyone had to leave to go out of the workshop, so we didn't have the full time to do it there. But maybe we'll repeat that next time and try to get through the whole content next year, uh, that full two hours. Um, but, but I think that there's a lot of fundamental issues about uh, about Christopher Alexander's work, that and and, and we, I think we've had a great discussion here because Colleen, thank you, and Chris, thank you very much for contributing because these are things that we don't get to discuss very often. We don't get the opportunity as a community to come together and think about what it is that's underneath all our work and all the assumptions we're making. Um, when we come up a little bit more and have that opportunity, then we can start saying. Well, we might do something differently that might improve the way the practice in the community works. Um, some of it may be on the right side and more context dependent. Some may be on the left side and more universal, but um, we should probably be addressing that. Do I answer your question, yeah, China? Yeah, I feel so much better. <laughs> <laughs> what was your, your topic at Purple Sun? Just, you, you said it, but I forgot. Uh, that was expl so first I, I did a 30 minute talk um, and then I did a one and a half hour workshop which was exploring the context of, of uh, pattern language because this this one has been focused very much inside the pattern language so for the system person I'm inside the system but there's also a whole bunch of stuff happening outside the pattern language system um, and, and and one of the the quotable quotes I have from uh, Max J Jacobson said, if it's a wicked problem, like that's not what pattern language is for. Pattern language is not for wicked problems. And, and then we have a person sitting right behind and says, that's all I use pattern language for is for wicked problems. And then I have to do the definition of what is a wicked problem. And, and so if you want to use something like pattern language, then you, know, you need to adapt the work of Mr. Alexander. You can't take, you can't take it strictly. Who said you did adapt it for, for wicked problems? 
that it is not her? No, who said it was exactly her, her repeat problem? No, no, the woman said behind the woman that's working with me, I'm not sure who this woman was, but she is someone that's coming to Purple Sock and says that she is using pattern language specifically for wicked problems. Yeah, I did also remember who it was. No, I don't remember her name, I'm sorry. Yeah. Do you remember, Christian, who it was? Uh, he was in the front of the room. <laughs> no, 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 I know who it was. I don't know. I didn't yeah. But, but uh, again, it's, it's, so so now she has ammunition she's, to speak about it. the comments. <laughs> oh, is it, is it um, Silke? I'm a bad name. But yeah. Uh, yeah, we can. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. if you tell us the name. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm taking the pattern language approach, but, um, um, and I think we'll discuss it later. So, so, so next month I'm teaching in Shanghai, and I think that I'm going to be calling it affordance language because I'm, making it, I'm doing it on affordances. Um, and, and it's going to require a lot more shifting to the right side than <laughs> off the left side. But I, but I believe in the hill side process, and I believe in the conferences, but it's a different domain, and so uh, I think we need to make some changes. But I think it does, you catch the subtlety of the difference between one side and the other is pretty hard, I find, I mean, because, uh, you know, you, you, you get to pattern language and you think it's one constituted, you know, thing, and, and, and so you get there and you grasp some of the things, and when you think you've grasped it, then it branches out, and you have these, so, so, it's, it's it's not obvious to, to make these distinctions. I mean, and it's, I feel it's great because otherwise you feel things are so ambiguous because they're different. You know, you see that there are contradictions. Uh, and probably I think there'd be a third column, I don't know which one exactly. Could be. But yes. uh, there could be one, well, which this is what we tried with the fourth generation. You know, systemic, mm -hmm. where we we looked at what the, the what the patterns, uh, like the processes that that are generated by what the patterns enable to build, and and I discovered a, a term that I thought you know I was going to uh, it was ontological design. I don't know if you've heard about Ontology. that. Ontological design. Ontological design. Oh yes, a language active perspective. Yes, sure. And and so from what I understand, it's about the the life or the processes that what your designs. It's the way your designs design you back, or it's the way what you design uh, has itself a design action on your environments and on yourselves and on us as a as social. Uh, systems, mm -hmm. and so I think this column is actually missing. Is is the part that what's the consequence of what we design, and what are the processes that are unleashed with our designs? And I think that I reiterate that what you had on your first slide, which was Christopher Alexander's intervention at. Upsla in 96 was to say, hey, what are you doing with your code and what are you doing with your software? You're not changing the world for the better. Right. Well, that's in this third, in this other, uh, another uh, column, yeah. Column or dimension. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I think we've exhausted everyone now. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. Um, for those of you who have not picked up a bookmark, please do so and um, you can find me. And the recording will be online sometime. Thank you. Thank you.